Welcome to Community Matters. I'm your host, Katherine Knorr, filling in for Jay Fidel today. Our topic is long-term broadband access in Hawaii. How well are we doing? My host is Bert Lum, the Broadband Strategy Officer for the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office. Welcome, Bert. Thanks, Catherine. Good to be here. All right. So I think that there's a fundamental question that we kind of think we know, but we may not really know. What is broadband? Well, that's a, that's a, a good question to start off with. You know, I think everybody is used to the idea of, of having some form of Internet access. And, and broadly speaking, broadband is your Internet access. Now, the, you know, the quality of that Internet connection could vary between, you know, how, what kind of service you might have gotten. Now, I remember in the, in the olden days, we would have uh, dial-up and we would have, uh, you know, a su subscription that might have uh, included some kind of, I don't know, um, 24 baud, you know, connection. But the speeds have obviously increased since then. But there's a, a pretty great disparity on what kind of speeds uh, people have, and even if they have a, an internet connection. So, uh, from a from a functional standpoint, uh, the you know the Federal Communications Commission has set a bar for. 25 megabits download and three megabits upload. And that bar has been, you know, grossly sort of uh, over, overpassed or, you know, passed by the kinds of applications that we all are, are very much used to. So if you think about whether you're at home during a Zoom call or, or um, doing uh, some kind of uh, uh, work at home or, or education at home or, or even doing some kind of a tele telehealth uh, consultation, and and imagine if you had multiple people doing that from your from your home, a twenty five three service would probably be far uh, uh, underperforming. So so lately the um, discussion has been around uh, upping that that uh, low benchmark to. 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up, and I've always I've I've also seen some of the FCC uh, projects um, at the level of of or having to meet the level of 100 down and 100 up. That's 100 you know megabits uh, symmetric. So to answer your question, you know the broadband has has uh, definitely improved in its in its definition of what is broadband. The, the question now becomes who is perhaps being left behind in getting an internet connection? And what I think we realized during the pandemic, and, and this is a, as a result of perhaps having to be, um, you know, sort of sheltered at home, um, many people didn't have internet access at home. And so, you know, if you, if you kind of look at some of the uh, census numbers on, on how many people were not even connected. Uh, we're looking at something like 55,000 households in Hawaii that aren't connected. So it's not just a matter of, you know, what is the speed of broadband? And, and I think there's a, probably a lot of people that are kind of at a, at a subpar uh, level of, of what kind of subscription they might have. Uh, it's also a matter of how many people even can afford to get a broadband connection? So there's a whole slew of, of issues that need to be addressed from, from access to affordability to the actual ability to use the technology once you get it. Sure. So I remember having a modem way back when I was in law school and I had an Apple IIc. And now, years and years later, um, all of a sudden, our lives revolve around broadband. They were, you know, we've suddenly with COVID, we've entered into this world where our, much of our lives are on Zoom or on uh, mm -hmm. another meeting platform. So one, one issue that 
comes to mind when we talk about this is most of the world has mobile phones. However, not all of the world has PCs and laptops. And does broadband impact the use of our mobile phones as well? That's a good question. So when we start to talk about the different devices that might be connected to that internet subscription, you have your typical landline connection, which would be provided by the Hawaiian Telecom or like a charter spectrum. Uh, and, and that would be bringing a physical line to your home uh, that you could then connect your, uh, your, whether it's a desktop computer or a laptop computer. And then of course, you know, with the advancements in the wireless industry, you know, we saw, um, I remember, I remember, you know, these huge Motorola brick phones that people were using. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, it was kind of the state of the art, but that, that uh, evolved to the sort of, <clears throat> sort of the flip phone. And I thought, oh, wow, these flip phones, they look pretty cool because they remind me of uh, the Star Trek uh, communicator. But the ability for that phone to really do a lot of functional things was limited by the, uh, the service. And, and we're talking back when, you know, it was like a 2G kind of a service or, or even like a 3G service. What really transformed the, the whole mobile experience was, was 4G. And 4G enabled uh, more bandwidth. <clears throat> and and the, the protocol enabled, um, you know, a much richer experience by the user being able to access websites. And of course, we all remember uh, what happened with the iPhone and the fact that the iPhone was a, a, a really a game changer in terms of how you interact online to all the online resources you know, that are available. So, so that's the um, kind of evolution of, of the wireless. And then you have now the introduction of, of 5G, which is the next level of protocol that is uh, uh, being un, un, uh unfolding in front of us uh, as a result of, you know, carriers like, like uh, Verizon, wireless, uh, Verizon, uh, AT&T, and T-Mobile. So that is going to be a, a continued, I think, um, enabler of, of more applications uh, being able to be delivered on the mobile device. Now, I think, I think your question really, really sort of begs the issue of uh, you know, what devices are we talking about when talking about broadband? And we're, so we're talking about both the landline connected, could be a laptop, could be a desktop. And we're also talking about tablets. And that could be, that could be a mobile connection or it could be at home on, on your Wi-Fi. Or it could be a smartphone that you now have that is uh, with you all the time. It's your mobile device. And that's why the, um, the federal government for, for many of these projects uh, that are, are kind of rolling out to get funded, uh, they are, are looking at something called the um, uh, sort of technology neutral, and, and it could be, it could be uh, fiber-based, it could be wireless. But again, it depends on the, the program and, and, and how, um, I guess from a cost standpoint, how economical it is to deliver the service to a, a wide swath of, of geography. And sometimes, you know, running fiber to every home might not be the, you know, the uh, most cost effective. And that's why uh, wireless solutions are also part of the, um, part of the technological mix that could be proposed. Now, so, you know, what's interesting to me is, is that this idea of the importance of broadband, is it, you know, before I used to think of the internet as sort of a luxury that if you have extra money that you would have good internet access, you would have a laptop, a PC, a mobile phone. But as our society has progressed, it seems to me that broadband and the access to the internet is actually more important. 
uh, in our daily functioning. What are your thoughts on our actual needs versus wants in relation to broadband? Well, of course, you're you're talking to the the, the broadband strategy officer, so uh, I'm going to be a, a little uh, biased. But there have been others that that uh, have been really promoting the idea of of uh, broadband and internet as a human right, because we have gotten to the point where the you know the ability for us to do a lot of what we currently do in our daily lives are gonna are are already dependent on the internet, and and if you look at at Hawaii, and I'll I'll kind of look at it from a uh, first from a kind of a statewide standpoint, you know we're we're in the middle of the Pacific, and a lot of what our commerce and and uh, sort of business activity revolves around is our ability to connect not only in the state, but across, you know, the Pacific Ocean. So, you know, there's, uh, you can always, you can always uh, think of, well, maybe, maybe I'll just fly there, <laughs> or maybe I'll just send a, you know, a snail mail letter to whoever I want to send something to, or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll catch a boat to the West Coast to get to, you know, get to the West Coast. Um, if, if commerce were, were limited by that, that sort of physical, need to, to, to jump on a plane or jump on a boat, uh, you would be at a great disadvantage in Hawaii. And I think that's true across the entire globe. And when you start to look at, you know, if you're uh, in, a, in a location and you're, you know, let's say, let's say just an example, you're at home and you're, you're uh, because of the pandemic, you're sheltered at home, and you, but you still need to conduct the variety of things that you need to do, whether it's education, whether it's uh, doing uh, remote work or working from home, uh, whether it's doing a, a health uh, consultation. And, you know, if you were to, let's say there's a, a program that um, was rolled out last year called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and you wanted to access uh, this benefit, one of the, you know, one of the ways that you could do that is through your internet connection. And so how do you get access to some of these government services? Uh, now, you know, in the case of the EBB, uh, you know, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, I mean, they did re recognize that people may not be connected and this might be a way to get them connected. So you could, you could actually, uh, you know, get um, material sent to you and then you could fill it out on a, on a physical uh, form and then mail it in and then go through that qualification process. But you can you can start to see how disadvantaged you might be if you're not connected and you're limited to some of the the, the physical means of communications. And then you start to look at also the um, you know what is what is the economy and what are the sort of the tech drivers and and what is this this digital economy that we uh, oftentimes talk about. If 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 Hawaii wants to diversify its economy, um, you, you know, it's not a hard argument to make, to understand that broadband and things like digital equity are foundational upon which, whether it's our, our students or, or even uh, kupuna and everybody in between would need to have as a foundational uh, skill and tool in order to you know, not only participate, but perhaps create new applications, perhaps uh, create new companies, come up with new ideas that would really spark uh, perhaps a, a new business or a new industry. And, and any industry that you might think of that is already uh, kind of a um, existing uh, traditional legacy uh, business from, from agriculture to, to, to tourism, all depend on some form of connectivity. So if you were to say, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a farmer, I don't need the internet. But how do, you, how do you start now looking at the supply chain that you are tied to to get your uh, produce out to the marketplace, right? And then if Hawaii wants to go beyond just um, selling to the local uh, market, it has to look at being able to 
uh, create product that could perhaps, perhaps uh, get sold through um, mainland markets or Asian markets. And what better way to do that uh, than have a, a distribution uh, system that includes a, a website and uh, some e-commerce and some ability to to do some transactions and fulfill you know fulfill orders. That's all going to be as a result of your your ability to leverage the internet and the the technology that uh, comes along with that. You know, it's really interesting. My show on Wednesdays is the wide world of esports, and before the pandemic. Uh, one of the big issues was latency in relation to competitive video gaming. And uh, surprisingly enough, um, the Overwatch League came to Hawaii uh, last summer. And were able, and the reason why they did is in order to make it, you know, get the people from um, U.S. mainland closer to Japan, and they ran a line uh, in order to have better broad broadband and less ping. And so, what are your thoughts about that? Well, if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh, they would have perhaps chosen another place to to do uh, the Overwatch uh, League tournament. What what really happened, and it, it really gave Hawaii an opportunity to show what it is that we're capable of doing. Sometimes you would think, wow, from the middle of the Pacific. In, in the case of Overwatch, uh, they were looking at uh, latencies and, and their primary communication was between the, the US and Asia. <clears throat> and the, I think the actual Overwatch servers were someplace in, in um, I think Japan or uh, could have been in China. There were, there were players that were uh, from China, uh, there were players from Korea, and there were players from the U.S. And when Overwatch was looking for a place to actually do this, they they were thinking, well, you know, it is physically challenging for us to actually all go to China, where I think some of the um, tournament took place. So there was one aspect of the the physical location, and then there was the aspect of you know what what location in the U.S. had the best uh, latency to, to get to, uh, to a place like China. And what happened is that um, uh, in the case of um, the Overwatch League, they were uh, able to connect with uh, the folks over at the University of Hawaii, which actually has a direct connection into Japan uh, from the um, uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Fiber system called the uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, fiber. And if you think about it, you, you know, between, we, between Japan and U.S. Uh, or Japan and Hawaii, if, if your fiber connection is pretty uh, straight, a straight run, you know, between the two countries, uh, your, your latency is, is somewhat due to the, not only the speed of light, but maybe the, the number of hops that you have to go from router to router to get to your final destination. And, and Hawaii had the benefit of having this direct route right to right to Japan. So our latencies were really uh, already um, well well within the expectations of the Overwatch, you know, uh, organizers. So they said, "Wow, you know, we don't have to go to China. We don't have to go to Asia. We can we can all go to Hawaii. Hawaii is a, a, a COVID safe place, you know." And and this is this is pre pre. Um, um, Delta, I think, and 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 what happened was uh, uh, they they um, had the tournament held over at the uh, University I Lab. Uh, they had this great connection, you know, to uh, through the JUS uh, JUS cable, and uh, I think it put it really put uh, Hawaii on the map to have you know this esports competition take place right here on 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 US ground and and be. Uh, as competitive, you know, with with uh, these players in Asia. Do you think that opens the door for more uh, opportunities for Hawaii um, in light of that direct connection to Japan? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I think the the fact that Overwatch took place in Hawaii not only brought attention to Hawaii from um, from an organizing 
you know committee that was based on the on the on the continent. Uh, but it also brought um, an awareness of you know the program that that Sky has over at UH, uh, as well as uh, the fact that you know there's a, a great um, um, esports arena over at the uh, Hawaii Pacific University, and so there's already a uh, you know a presence here uh, to have esports tournaments as well as the esports um, curriculum, getting students more aware of what it what it's like to be kind of an you know in the esports field. Uh, and so the combination of all that, I think, uh, you know, was was uh, good for Hawaii. Now it's a question of whether or not that can be um, continued to sustain itself. And and Catherine, you know, because of your your uh, program as well as uh, you know Sky's program and and the folks over at HPU, you know, there's there's a uh, there's ongoing activity in all of this area, which which I think uh, continues to kind of maintain that that momentum. And I think that's that's uh, really important. Sure, and you know, there's also UH West Oahu that has a new creative media center that's going to be um, uh, in the mix um, very soon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so let's move back to your, your um, mention of the 55,000 people who don't have broadband. What what about outer islands? Is there a disparity between their access to broadband versus Oahu's access and the quality. So what has happened over the course of uh, time and, and what has become so evident during the pandemic is the fact that if, if you leave it strictly to the private sector, what the private sector will want to do is they will want to put money into a place where they can get a quick return on the investment. So. Obviously, you know if you're if you're on Oahu and you're part of an urban, you know, uh, urban center, uh, the the um, private sector and the private sector are typically the cable company, which is Charter, and the, the telephone company, which is Hawaiian Telecom. They will evaluate, you know, their their investment, their money, and look at where can where can they get their best return. So as they go through their kind of business uh, modeling and and budgeting and uh, implementation schedule. Uh, the the rural communities on the neighbor islands tend to be um, <clears throat> not as quick a return on the investment. So, you know, there's a lot of areas that are are very much lacking in in uh, getting any kind of physical infrastructure like fiber. So, if you're talking about areas like uh, Una or Kau or uh, you know, Ocean View or or, you know, we had a call with some uh, some of the community over in the Mililii and, and looking at how do we how do we enable, you know, their connectivity and and even even on Maui, uh, you know, the, the folks uh, over in Hana have been regular participants in our in our broadband hui. So, so the question becomes, <clears throat> what is what is going to change in the, uh, you know, sort of new. Um, programs that are being rolled out by the federal government. So the federal government has recognized that, you know, the private sector can do so much because they're, they're basically driven by some of this ROI and, and uh, stakeholder um, or shareholder uh, commitments uh, to make a profit. <clears throat> so the, the federal government has, has um, several programs that will fund uh, this kind of uh, uh, broadband deployment, and I'll, I'll speak to three uh, fairly large size um, programs that are are going to be kind of rolled out. The first one is is coming out of the uh, uh, consolidate. Well, it's called com coming out of the um, uh, American Rescue Plan. It's called the uh, Capital Projects Fund, and the Capital Projects Fund is something to the tune of about 115 million dollars, and so that. That is the first uh, large, uh, what I what I call a tranche of money that uh, we, Hawaii, will need to uh, um, apply for. We we will get the 115, but we have to go through a uh, uh, an application process, and that process includes something called a grant plan. And then within the grant plan, uh, there are specific projects that that constitute what that grant plan is, and that. Those projects need to be 
identified to the detail that they, in essence, roll up to the $115 million. So that's, that's uh, one tranche of money. The, the next one that is going to be uh, kind of rolling out is um, actually, you know, it's, it should be any day soon now is, is about $90 million that will go to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And, and, and the Department of Hawaiian Homelands with this 90 million could uh, use it for a wide range of, of uh, um, offerings from, from everything from uh, telehealth to digital literacy to uh, affordability programs to even, even doing uh, cable landings on, on Hawaiian Homeland. So there's a wide range of, of um, opportunity. Uh, I think Hawaiian Homelands will also be using some of that money to leverage the uh, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum that we were able to uh, get the FCC to, uh, you know, allocate or and and make available to uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. This this 2.5 gigahertz. So let me look, quick little background. Um, they made it available to Native Americans, Native Alaskans, and in Hawaii, since uh, there's no federal recognition of of uh, Native Hawaiian people, uh, we we petitioned the FCC to consider. Uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands as the representative uh, because the FCC or the federal government recognizes uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the homelands that uh, you know they administer. So, so there's a 2.5 gigahertz spectrum that will be used for connectivity uh, as well. So that's a, that's a second tranche of money. The third tranche of money is coming from the um, what they call the IIJA, which is the uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, which uh, was recently signed, and there's a category within it called the BEAD, B-E-A-D, and the BEAD stands for Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, and that's another hundred million, and that hundred million uh, needs to be used primarily for unserved and underserved areas, and so there's a pretty, you know, pretty um, um, clear definition <clears throat> definition of what unserved and underserved is. So. You know, our, our, our ask, once the details of how they're going to roll out the, the BEAD program is to determine what uh, areas uh, are, are um, you know, qualify for um, this BEAD money uh, that is um, um, consistent with the definition of uh, what the, what the um, and this is a, this is a um, uh, NTIA which is NTIA is the National Telecommunications Information Administration, and they will administer, you know, the use of that money for those unserved, underserved areas. Well, well that's terrific, Bert. Um, we have uh, run out of time. Um, and, <laughs> I know. And thanks to our excellent broadband today, we were able to bring this program to you. Uh, thank you so much, Bert. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Catherine. And, and, uh, of course, thanks, Jay, for you know keeping the keeping the lights on for for Think Tech. Great, great program. Absolutely, and thank you to our viewers for watching today. And please tune in for my show, The Wide World of Esports, tomorrow at noon Hawaii time. See you then.